Amen. Hold on just a second. I bet you it won't do it now. All right. Where's my box cutter knife? I'll fix this mess. All right. Now you can give me a little volume. I have a meeting with the sound men tonight early, if if y'all don't mind, about 6.15, I mean 5.15. And we'll we'll try to get this straightened out. Andy, everybody that works in the sound, video and everything, will come early this evening. We can't do that. We do want to uh, apologize for that. We had everything moved over there, and it all gets hooked up wrong. Wedding yesterday messed it all up again. That was that man's fault right over there. Newlyweds, stand up over there, Zach. Newlyweds, let's give him a big hand. Been married 24 hours now. Y'all pray for that poor girl. All right. Amen. All right. I'm still... All right, we're doing better now. Let's open our Bible now to Psalm 11. Psalm 11. Psalm 11. And uh, I am going to deal with this. If you, if this is the first time you've been here, I, I'm a, I never preach like this on Sunday morning. What I'm going to do this morning, hardly ever. I'm going to take some time, slow down a little bit. I'm going to read some things. And uh, we're going to talk about this vote, historic vote, one time only vote that's coming up in North Carolina this coming Tuesday called the Marriage Amendment. And I'm going to lead up to it by saying several other things this morning that you'll, uh, you'll be interested in, I'm sure. So you want to pay attention this morning. I'm not going to be as, as uh, maybe as, as boisterous as normal. So I'm, I'm going to slow down just a little bit, try to be a help to you, and I want you to listen to what I'm going to say. Because you're going to hear all kinds of stuff about this in the next two days. We're having war right here in North Carolina over this marriage amendment vote that's coming up. Every, every state in the country has got their eyes on North Carolina. And the activists, it's what they used to call them protesters, activists are put hundreds of thousands of dollars both ways to get this vote to go their way. So uh, the marriage amendment in North Carolina simply means that they will amend our constitution in this, country, in this uh, state to say that marriage is defined by a man and a woman. I heard Brother Derek say in Sunday school that we shouldn't even be having this conversation. That's absolutely right. Our forefathers would have never believed that you'd even that something like this would even be considered. But it shows the downward spiral that our country is on this morning. We are in trouble with God. And the way you know we're in trouble with God is we don't even realize it. That's what makes it so scary. We think we can just joke it off like everything's a joke. And good old God, He'll just put up with anything. But I'm going to tell you something. The, the, the judgment of God finally does fall, people. It falls on individuals, falls on nations, it falls on countries, and our country this morning is in trouble. We got this idea in America that we're like the Titanic, it can't sink, it, oh, we'll make it, America's always made it, we'll show them what America made out. Listen, the Bible said the wicked will be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. We've not only forgotten God, that happened a long time ago, we're voting Him out. Psalm 11. Verse 3. Psalm 11 and verse 3. If the foundation, get down just a hair, brother, be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want to show you something this morning. And I'd like to take maybe, maybe, uh, Damien, if you would go into my office and get me that little table over there in the corner. I think it's got a lamp on it. A little table about this big. And I want to show you something this morning. This thought just hit my mind. The Bible said that if the foundations of something are destroyed, then, then what can you do? I'm going to talk a little bit about the foundations of our country today. And in doing this, I want to say that every 
building, this one included, has foundations. If those foundations are destroyed, the building collapses. No matter how strong it is, no matter how big it is, no matter how pretty it is, no matter how expensive it is, the building will fall if the foundations are destroyed. Yeah, there you go. This little, little table right here, let's just let this table represent any building that you've ever seen. I'm going to set it right here right now. You'll see that that table has four legs and feet, and this table is holding this table up, and the floor, concrete, is holding this table up, and dirt, packed dirt, and rock underneath that is holding this floor up. That's foundation. Now, this table here this morning has four legs. Now, I'm going to let this table here represent our country, America. There's, there's four legs that hold our country up. One of them is the church. One of them is the government. One of them is the schools. And the other one is the home. And I've named those not necessarily in order of importance. The church is the most important. But the church, the government, the school system, and our home. Those are the four legs. If any one of them is wrong or out of whack, that table's going to be wobbly or fall. And if the foundations of that are destroyed, it's going to clap. It don't matter how strong this is. It don't matter how strong this is. It don't matter how, how right, the, the foundations of that table are those four things. I read about what used to be the largest building in the world, the Empire State Building, that World Trade Center. They stuck it on up a little bit further so it would be taller. And there's one in Chicago, one somewhere in another country. But for many, many years, the Empire State Building was the biggest building in the world. I read about it, and let me tell you a little bit about it. It's at the corner of the most crowded crossroads in the world, 5th Avenue and 34th Street. If you've ever been to the Empire State Building, it's absolutely breathtaking. When you're down there at the bottom of that thing and look up, it, it looks like it's going like this. And it might be, I don't know. It looks like it's moving. When you're on top of it, it looks like it's moving. I'm telling you, it, it's unbelievable. The Empire State Building was 103 stories. That's a quarter of a mile straight up. There are 75 miles of water pipes inside that one building. 300,000 electrical outlets inside that one building. In, in an emergency, the, the Empire State Building, if they had to use it, would hold 80,000 people for shelter. That's... That's as many people as there is in Burke County almost could get inside the Empire State Building and shelter, find shelter in a case. That's a, that's a big building. 80,000 people. It weighs over 300,000 tons. But the Empire State Building is not just sticking up there. The foundation is what holds it. Here's what you don't see. You don't see it when you see the building. That thing got... Uh, that thing got, uh, I forgot how many windows, 6,000 windows in it. 6,000 big, gigantic windows. You know, it's, well, King Kong busted out a few of them, but those, uh, they, they got them fixed. That was 1930-something. But uh, there was big windows, man, and King Kong stick his arm in there and grab somebody. But uh, anyway, they're 33 feet down below the surface of the sidewalk is the foundations of that building. 33 feet. That's uh, about as far as from here uh, to the wall over there. 33 feet. Just about that far. Uh, maybe right in here somewhere. Uh, th from here to that wall, straight down underneath the ground. Now this building here this morning, our foundations around here, is only about this concrete about that deep for this building. 33 feet straight down, concrete and steel. And you know why it only goes that deep? Because up in New York, the, underneath that, people wonder how all them big buildings stick up. New, New York's just a little bitty skinny piece of land. Underneath New York is solid granite. And granite is the strongest foundation in the world. It's what the, the earth is made out of. The hard rock in the world. Granite. And the Empire State Building rests on a 33 feet thick foundation sitting on solid granite. 
and, 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 and geologists and scientists say that outside of a massive earthquake, nothing could ever move the Empire State Building. That thing got some foundation in it. It does. Now, the Lord's going to knock it down one day, but uh, the foundation, when, when everybody goes in the, in the, in the uh, I think like sometimes 30,000 30, visitors a day go in that place, and they don't even think about that solid concrete down underneath on that, that granite rock bed. They don't even think about the foundation. Now, the United States... We see, we see the lakes, we see the mountains, we see the Grand Canyon, uh, uh, we see big buildings, we see our schools, we see churches, we see our kids out playing and then having fun, and we think, boy, we got a great country, but we don't see the underlying foundation that hold this country up. I'm going to talk about them just for a minute this morning, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. There are four corners. The first one, of course, is the church. The church this morning is not just an organization. It is an organism. That means it's alive. The church is an organism. The, uh, it's not a, a man-made organization. It is an organism, meaning it, it's got life in it. It's not like the Moose Club or the Goose Club or the, or the Lions or the Kiwanis. It's not like anything else in the world. There's nothing in the world like the church. The church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Down just a hand, please. Listen, the church is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church teaching the Bible is what built our culture and our character of America. The, our laws, our constitution, our customs, the way we treat people, our justice system, everything we have here in America was built by people believing and preaching the Bible, the Word of God, and getting people saved. Do you know why they call this part of the country the Bible Belt? Do you know why they call North and South Carolina and Georgia, the South, the Bible Belt? Is because 150 years ago, 200 years ago, preachers went up and down this, this, the eastern seaboard preaching camp meetings. And they set up old Brush Harbor tent meetings. And people would come from miles around. And old bootleggers would hit the altar and get saved. And people would shout. And people would pray for their family and loved ones and they'd get saved. And they'd come and repent and be crying in their and their prayers would be answered. Get that movie that Bob Jones University put out, Sheffy, and, and look at that thing. Unbelievable. The story of Robert Sheffy, the old-fashioned Methodist circuit-riding preacher. And you'll see what built the South is old-fashioned. And, and uh, uh, Charles Finney and them guys, Whitfield, people like that, come up during those days and they built, they, they preached, and they preached, and churches started popping up everywhere. You know why it's so different down south than it is up north? The Catholic Church basically took root up north. They had a completely different way of thinking, worship, and everything, and the old-fashioned Bible preaching took root down south. And so churches popped up everywhere. Everybody here this morning was saved in a church or because of one. You listening? Everybody here this morning was saved in a church or because of one. If you didn't get saved at church, you got saved because some church, somewhere, preached the gospel, put out a track, put out a video, uh, put out a, a witness, a soul winner, a preacher, somebody that was, uh, was saved in or because of a church got the gospel to you. The Bible Belt was, was, um, was rooted in revival and camp meetings. And America has now over 300,000 churches. Thank God for the church. I thank God for the church. Listen, the church has faults and the church isn't perfect, but the church this morning is one of the foundations of this nation. If you don't believe it, go to a nation where they don't have churches. Go to a nation where there is no Bible preaching churches. You think the Bible suppresses women's rights? Go to a church, go to a country where they don't have Bible preaching and look at how women and children are treated. Go to a place where they don't preach the Bible. Listen, the Bible exalts womanhood to its highest order. The Bible exalts uh, the family and our nation, our government up where it needs to be. And brother, there is nothing in this world more important than a Bible preaching, Bible believing church. Listen, there ain't nothing can take the place. That's why you better be careful before you leave your church. You better be careful. Well, I wouldn't leave. If God put me in a Bible believing church, I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave for a paycheck. I wouldn't leave just uh, for a marriage. I wouldn't leave just because somebody offered me that. I wouldn't do it. Listen, you better be careful this morning. The church 
is the most important thing. I'd rather have my family in a good old fashioned Bible believing preaching church than anything in this world because that's where they're going to turn out one of these days. Amen? The church is the foundation of our nation. But let me say secondly, I've got to move to get to where I'm going to get to. This morning, the schools, our schools. The first school, you understand, was held in the church and the Bible itself was the first textbook in this country. They used the Bible as a textbook. And, and they used, they teach the Bible. They'd teach them Bible stories. They'd teach them Bible truths. Uh, we're not a bunch of fanatics trying to cram religion in the public school. We just like to see it get where, where we always were in this country until the 1960s when our Supreme Court voted God and the Bible officially out. I want to say this morning, they, they, they taught lessons on truth. Well, uh, I don't understand why we couldn't have, and some teachers do thank God, thank God for the public school teachers we have that, that love the Lord and try to do the best they can, but the system itself should implicate and in, include in the curriculum lessons on being honest and treating people right. I mean, you ought to have a whole lesson for third graders like they used to on a little girl that came in and like the McGuffey readers. The little girl comes in and she tells her mama something and mama said, now honey, is that the truth? And then she goes back and finds out that she didn't tell the truth and she said, no, I did tell the truth and mommy found out she did tell the truth and bragged on the child for telling the truth and made a lesson out of it. Always be honest and tell the truth. You know why you don't hear a lot of stuff, emphasis on that nowadays? Because if you put a lot of emphasis on telling the truth, the truth, it sort of sounds like Bible a little bit. Thou shalt not lie. And we don't want to have to include that in, in our teaching anymore. Have you ever heard of the McGuffey Readers? The McGuffey Readers was the school textbook in America for many, many, many years. I'm going to give you a quote there from William McGuffey in uh, 1836. And I'm going to give you a quote from uh, uh, this man who influenced America. He said this, quote, this was our public school books. The Christian religion is the religion of our country. From it are derived our prevalent notions of the character of God, the great moral governor of the universe. On its doctrines are founded the peculiarities and of our free institution. The Ten Commandments and the teachings of Jesus are not only basic, but plenary. Over and over and over, McGuffey teaches that we teach our kids to do right, to treat people decent, to treat people as you want to be treated, to, to have no respected person. And, nobody. and ladies and gentlemen, our schools were a part of the foundation of this country. And, and as little by little, the devil would do everything in his power to take over. Uh, I want to tell you something. Do you realize that our colleges this morning were founded upon Princeton. You ever heard of Princeton University? Princeton University, it was founded in 1746 by a preacher. His name was Reverend Jonathan Dixon. He, called, he said this, the president of Princeton University said, Cursed be all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. Amen. The president of Princeton said, Cursed be every kind of learning that's contrary to the cross. If the president of Princeton said that now, he'd be fired by this evening. Our foundations are being destroyed. You say, well, all he said was cursed be any kind of teaching. You know what he's saying? Cursed be evolution. Cursed be situation ethics. Cursed be homosexuality and adultery teaching. Cursed be all religions are the same teaching. Cursed be Islam. Cursed be Buddhism. Cursed uh, be yoga. Puss, cursed be, uh, he said, every teaching that is contrary to the doctrine of the cross, let it be cursed. That's the foundation of this country. Amen? Let me tell you about Yale. Yale University. Y-A-L-E. 1701. Founded by ten congregational preachers. Ten preachers got together and founded Yale University and the requirements were the requirements were to diligently read the holy scriptures and the main end of every student was to know God in Jesus Christ. I tell you something. Yale, brother. Yale. 
People say that in a Christian school now, and they say, oh, them fanatics. And I, I'm talking about Yale, brother. Yale University said the main thing you kids come to college here is to know God through Jesus Christ. Think about that. What in the world? I'll tell you, the, the termites of hell are eating away at the foundation of this country. Kids used to think about heaven and hell. Kids used to look at everything in the context of heaven and hell. Said them two little boys one time. There's one down the road. And there was a dead seagull there. And one of them said, My goodness, what happened to that thing? He said, Well, he died and went to heaven. And other said, Well, what happened? Did God throw him back down here? Uh, used to be, people used to think like that. People used to have a, people used to have a, they looked at everything in the, eye, in the light of, there's a God, there's a hereafter, there's punishment or reward, there, there's a, there's an afterlife. It used to be in our thinking that God was right and the God of the Bible was the right God and so forth and so on. Not anymore. Harvard. You know who founded Harvard? You think, if you went to Harvard this morning and asked 500 of the first scholars you meet, who founded it and why he found it? You probably wouldn't find two of them that even knew. They're uneducated. They're being taught, but they're not being taught the right thing. John Harvard, Reverend John Harvard, a preacher, founded Harvard University in 1636, and the purpose of Harvard University was to train men to preach the Bible. Just what I'm doing today. Isn't that something? You know I went to Harvard, did you? I'm doing what they trained men to do back in 17, 1636. Before the revolution, 10 out of the first 12 pre, uh, presidents of Harvard were preachers. Before the American Revolution, ladies and gentlemen, 10 out of 12 presidents of Harvard University were preachers. 106 out of 108 of the first colleges in America were started by Christians and for the advancement of the Christian faith. Our school system this morning was designed as a foundation of our, our country and so we see that the termites are eating it. But let me give you the third one right quick and that is the government. The government. Let's talk about the government just a second. Our Constitution uh, 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 was, was given, and they, those men recorded it and wrote it. It was based on the Bible. I'm going to give you a few quotes about it this morning. Are you listening? John Quincy Adams. So great is my respect and veneration of the Bible that the sooner my children begin to read it, the more responsible members of society they'll be. Andrew Jackson, quote, That book, sir, is the rock on which our republic Rest. It's a foundation. He said our foundation of this nation is founded on that book. That's what the President of the United States used to say. Ronald Reagan, even back in the 80s, said we're going to have a year of the Bible. Buddy, we've come a long way since that day. If the President now, he won't, but if he would, get on there and have enough guts to get on there and say, we're going to honor the Bible, and his constituents would take a fit. But I'm going to tell you, brother, that our country was founded by men, and our presidents up until the last few years would take a stand on what God said in the Bible, and every president ought to. Every president ought to honor God. The American government and constitution, they say, is the most precious possession the world holds outside of the Word of God. And because the American system is the political expression of Christian ideas. There is, are y'all listening? There is no such thing in our constitution as separation of church and state. It don't exist. The liberal news media has just said that and said that and said that to where people really think that's in the Constitution. There is no such thing as separation of church and state. It don't exist. There is nowhere in our Constitution where it said the church is supposed to stay out of politics or government. There is no such thing as that. Are you all listening to me? We've been brainwashed. They're trying to bring our nation down this morning. The Constitution was not given to keep church people out of politics. It was written to keep the government from trying to rule the church and said Congress shall make no law regarding religion or the practice thereof. It was written to keep the government's nose out of the church if you want it plain and simple. Say amen right there. Amen. The government. Are you listening? 
Let me read you a little something here this morning. In this Constitution for the state of North Carolina, did you know your state that you live in right now, the Constitution of the state of North Carolina states, quote, no person who shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion or divine authority of the Old and New Testament or shall hold religious principles incompatible with the principle and safety of the state shall hold any office or place of trust in the department within this state. You couldn't even hold office in the state of North Carolina if you didn't believe the Old and New Testaments. You say, well, that's awful. Well, it sure did work a lot better than what we're doing now. We're going bankrupt, people. We're going bankrupt. Let me read you another one right quick. This is a quote from a Supreme Court. I said, the Supreme Court, my soul. What about this? I want you to listen to this. United States Supreme Court, 1885, in the case of Murphy versus Ramsey, it gave its opinion, quote, the idea of the family, I'm getting to that in just a minute, as consisting in and springing from the union for life of one man and one woman in a holy state of matrimony, the family is the sure foundation that is stable and noble in our civilization and the best guarantee of the reverent morality which is the source of all beneficial progress in the social and political improvement. Preacher couldn't have said it better. The Supreme Court of America in 1885 said the foundation of this country is a marriage between a man and a woman bringing kids into the world. That's nature and that's the way God intended it. And I'll say lastly, I'm going to talk about the home. In Genesis 2, God made the home. One man, one woman. We done been through this so many times, you don't have to be a scientist to figure it out. God made a man, and then God put Adam to sleep. He took the rib from him. He formed the woman out of man, woman, womb. Man with a womb, woman. And He made her. He gave her to man. He made Eve. God made Adam. God made Eve. The Bible didn't say He done it any other way. He performed the first wedding ceremony there in the Garden of Eden. They produced children. If that's always the way it's been. That's always the way it's supposed to be. There is no other definition of a of a, of, a, of a family. There is no other definition of a family. That is the definition of a family is a man, a woman, and children. And God designed a man for a woman. And God designed a woman for a man. And that is the only way and plan that God... And that's one of the foundations that's holding our country up this morning. Amen? Now immediately there's a roar of protest that says, oh, you people are judging and we want equal rights. And we aren't. It's got nothing to do with judging. It's got nothing to do with right. It's what God did and made it natural. It's natural. Homosexuality is unnatural, people. I'm not picking on that one sin. There's the other sin. I mean, if a, if a person says, well, I'm an adulterer and I've always wanted to commit adultery and I've always had this in my heart and there's a lot of them like that. And I just naturally feel like this and it's just me. It's just who I am. Well, guess what? It's still wrong. Amen. If a man says, I'm a kleptomaniac and, and I just want to steal everything. I was born this way. I was born a thief and I just want to steal. Well, I hate it for you, buddy. But it's wrong and you'll be punished for it. That's not a judgment. You, it, it, it's wrong because God said it's wrong. It's wrong because God said it's wrong in the Bible. And it's unnatural. You know what unnatural means? It's against nature. Let's take our Bible and turn to Romans chapter 1. Just a second. I told you it's very unusual for me to do this on, on a, on a uh, Sunday morning, but I, I felt I, I had to uh, because of this vote coming up Tuesday. Uh, Romans chapter number 1. Let me show you something in the Bible. Brother Derek done hit the Old Testament back there this morning, and I've already heard people uh, this past week saying, well, that's Old Testament and that's Old Testament. But anything in the Old Testament that is in the moral law, we are still bound by, and the whole world bound by. God never changed his mind on anything moral. He did the ceremonial law and, the, and some of that kind of stuff, but not the moral law. It's still wrong to kill people. It's still, these same people believe it's all right to be homosexual. They believe it's wrong to kill somebody. They think it's wrong if you kill them. You can't just pick and choose 
well, that's wrong, but this isn't wrong because I want to do it. You can't do that. You, uh, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's me, I'm wrong. If it's my kids, they're wrong. If it's my mother, she's wrong. Let, let God be true and every man a liar. See, that's what our, our country was built upon. All right. To say homosexuality is right just because you feel that way would be the same thing as saying adultery is right because man, or drunkenness is right or lying is right or murder is right. Did you know there's some people that feel good when they murder people? They feel good murdering people. Does that mean it's all right and we should not judge them? Or they should not be, uh, uh, you know, they should have the same rights as everybody else? It's unnatural. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. And I want to look at Romans chapter 1. And I want to look down here at verse number 25. Now you look at this. And this ain't Old Testament and this ain't the Jews. This is New Testament to Gentiles and Christians and lost people. Wherefore, verse 24, I'm sorry, Romans 1, 24. God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Changed the Bible. That's why they hate the Bible. And worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God did give them up unto vile affections, for even their women... See, it's bad enough for the men, did it? He said, now the women become lesbians. Here's where lesbians are mentioned in the Bible. Even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It's against nature. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, figure. God designed us certain ways, and that if a woman with a woman, it's against nature. And it didn't say they was born like that. It said they changed it. That's what it said. They changed it. They weren't born that way. They changed it. They changed it. Watch it. You say, well, Ellen, I can't help Ellen and Helen. I can't help Adam and Steve. I'm just saying what the Bible said. This is the foundation of our country. It's against nature. Verse 27. Likewise also the men... Leaving the natural, see that word natural, use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly. They ain't right, awful, ugly. Receiving in themselves the recompense of their error. It's an error. An error, just like in baseball. It's an error. It ain't right. Which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Then he goes on and on and on. Leviticus chapter 18, uh, uh, Leviticus 20, Brother Derek mentioned in Sunday school, all those scriptures tell us what the Bible says about homosexuality. Now the Bible said it's without natural affection. Now what does that mean? It means this, a woman has a natural affection for her offspring. Right? It's natural. It's built in. You don't have to say, well, I'm going to love my child. Every woman in here this morning, boy, when you see that little baby, it's, you're in love with it forever. I mean, it's natural for a woman to have, love that child. I was uh, uh, over there taking that card, Brother Wayne, uh, over there yesterday. He told me, he said, Brother Danny, i got some birds nesting in my driveway. He said, so come up neighbor's driveway. So I went over there, and he come back down his driveway. He showed me, he said, now there's that bird. Strange kind of bird. I forgot what he said the name of it. They nest in rocks and gravel in people's driveway. He said that mama bird had, had two or three little eggs that she was hatching in the gravel right there. A little bitty bird. She had stripes on her and white like that. And he pulled over and stopped, and he said, now right there is where that nest. And I got out there and looked. Man, we pulled up in that car, and that little mama bird, she felt threatened. She thought we was going to get them eggs. And man, she looked at us, she went, <laughs> And man, her feathers stood up like that right there. And I, and I thought, my goodness, she's going to get me, Brother Wayne. It wasn't that big. That bird wasn't that big. That car was big as from here, that pulpit. And there's me and Brother Wayne... I could take that thing and just crush it with one hand, and that little mama bird looking at me like, you big ugly thing, come on down here, I'll bite your nose off. She was going to attack me. 
You know what that is? Natural affection. That mama bird has a natural affection. She would fight till you killed it to protect them babies. People, are y'all listening to me this morning? A chicken will stand up on her feet and claw you till you kill her before she'll let you have one of her baby chicks. Animals, that's natural. You don't have to try to have it. You don't learn that. It's built in. And the Bible says in the last day, people won't have that. And that's why you find, listen, you'd never find that bird, mama bird paying a doctor to smash them eggs and abort them. Animals don't do that. I'm going to tell you something else. There are no homosexual animals. It's not natural. Don't that tell you something? Have you got a brain? Or are you just looking for an excuse because somebody you know at work and he's fun to be around? Homosexuality will destroy the foundation of our country, destroys the unit of the family. Nothing personal. God, I'm, I'm just as sorry as they are. No, none of us are good. We're all ought to be in hell. But right's right and wrong's wrong, and that's wrong. If I do it, I'm wrong. If you do it, you're wrong. If your kids do it, they're wrong. If you do it, you're wrong. Ain't got nothing to do with judging. Ain't got nothing to do with being mean. Our, our home. The foundation of this country. I don't think we ought to hate nobody. The Bible said they're the ones that hate. They're haters of God, right on down there in Romans chapter 1. Don't talk to us about being haters. We don't hate nobody. I don't think I'm better than nobody. But I'm telling you, we got four foundations holding up this nation this morning. And North Carolina will vote to let that foundation be rotten or hold it up sure and tall this Tuesday. I ain't telling you how to vote. You ask God which what He wants you to do. Ask Him. Check it out by the Bible. Because the foundations are being destroyed. Now the reason we say this this morning is not to be mean or ugly. I know people struggle. You say, well, my goodness, I'm, I'm always been this way and I'd have to just, I just have to be miserable. Well, you, you better off be miserable and right than so-called happy and wrong. And God will bless you if you'll do the right thing and quit denying the truth. Our conscience is bound by the Word of God. Now, there's always people who will point out exceptions to try to overthrow the rule. You're going to hear it on the news. They'll say, well, I know a kid that was raised in an abusive home and the daddy drank and beat the mama. Don't you think that child would be better off with two loving mothers or two loving daddies or whatever? I'm going to tell you, there's always exceptions of the rule. There's always somebody that can pick out a situation and say, well, what about, you know, the exception does not overthrow the rule. The exception proves the rule. The exception proves there is a rule. And as a general rule, the best atmosphere for a child to be raised is in a good home with his real mom and his real dad. Statistics show this. In a loving home where they go to church and try to do right. You cannot improve on that. And anything to destroy that or anything to replace that is a substitute and the devil trying to destroy our foundations. I'm done. Let's stand by our head for prayer. Every head.